Like many of us, I look at what we're doing to the earth and each other and wonder, how do we get here? How can we fix it? I'm not good at organic farming or advocating effectively for better childcare. What I am good at is being curious about stuff and seeing links that other people may not necessarily see. So I'm going with my strengths, making this video, exploring the evolutionary process that seems to be leading us to become more compassionate beings. It's in this sense that I'm speaking about spirituality, not from a religious perspective. This video draws from the most recent research on the brain from the field of neurobiology, current understanding of the importance of early attachment and parenting, the leading edge of personality theory and psychotherapy, as well as the ancient wisdom of the chakra system. By drawing from these diverse sources, my aim is to show how the process of evolution is impelling us to become more compassionate spiritual beings. All sources for material and quotes can be found on my website. Quotation marks on screen indicate a direct quote. An asterisk indicates that the source for the reference can be found on my site. His Holiness the Dalai Lama tells us, all major religions carry basically the same message, compassion. For some, organized religion is part of their spiritual journey. For others, it is not. And for still others, what has been done in the name of religion has brought great pain and suffering. Compassion, however, is fundamental to spirituality and may be the chief law of human existence, according to Dostoevsky. Compassion has an association with peacefulness and is understood to flow from our hearts as many sources of wisdom inform us. The Dalai Lama describes the love we experience from our heart center as the foundation of all spiritual practice. And the peace at the center of our being has long been associated with spirituality, as in, may the peace of God be with you, and stillness is the altar of spirit. For those of you unfamiliar with it, let me briefly describe the chakra system. It's a model of development most clearly articulated within Hinduism. Its psychology and philosophy is the foundation of yogic practice, and it is comprised of seven levels. It's also found as part of the Greek mystery schools in ancient Egypt and in the writings of the early Christian mystics. The brain shows in its early development remarkable correspondences with the chakra system. And recent findings about the plasticity of the brain, how it can be changed, offer realistic hope for therapeutic work that can facilitate profound transformation within the personality system. The model of the personality system that informs and weaves through this piece is the internal family system, or IFS model. It's a psycho-spiritual model that recognizes the multiplicity of the personality and may be thought of as a kind of applied mindfulness. The IFS model describes qualities of the self, our true self, if you will, as courage, compassion, joy, creativity, connection, clarity, peace, all finding a home at the core of our being. There's a story I love from the Talmud, the central text of Rabbinic Judaism, as recounted by Rabbi Noah Weinberg. It tells us that before we were born, we have a personal angel who sits beside us and actually teaches us all the wisdom we will ever need to know. Then there is a little tap between the nose and the upper lip and everything is forgotten immediately. Our lives are about remembering what we know. That's why when we're thoughtful we do this, remembering the angel's tap. This theme, that our lives are a journey home to remembering our spiritual natures, is present in many cultures through many folk tales, songs, and other sources of wisdom. And it informs the practice of yoga, meaning union or goal, familiar to many in the West. Yoga involves using breath and body postures, asanas, to balance life force energy, prana, for greater health, happiness, and spiritual connection. The intent of the practice, rooted in Hindu philosophy, is to guide us in creating union between ourselves and universal consciousness. 
Hinduism echoes the basic tenet of every religion, that the soul is a spirit form or life force that only temporarily lives in a body. The idea here is that just as white light gets broken down to its component elements when refracted through a prism, so does the light of the soul, our life force, become similarly separated when we enter the body. This model describes our spiritual growth as a return from our base chakra to the crown. The chakra system details where aspects of our life force are localized in the body. And these aspects have developmental correspondences with both brain and personality research. The first base or root chakra is located at the base of the spine and is associated with survival and safety. When we talk about being grounded here. The feeling is, I am safe, I belong. It develops during the first year of life. It's during this first year of life that our brain is growing at a remarkable rate, more than doubling between the last trimester and the second year. When we talk about the human brain, we're actually talking about three brains in one, or the triune brain. These are three different systems that have evolved to work together and show relatively long periods of stability in brain evolution. The oldest of these in evolutionary terms is the reptilian brain, also known as the brain stem or body brain. It's what we're functioning with from birth to about four months. Its concerns are basic survival, eat or be eaten, Am I safe is the overriding concern, and it is fear-driven and territorial around shelter, food, and comfort. This part of the brain is the home of the autonomic nervous system, responsible for regulating alertness, heart rate, sleep, and breathing. And there are two aspects to this regulation. One is the sympathetic, which acts as a quick response mobilizing system, commonly known as fight or flight. We often talk about an adrenaline rush when we experience this arousal and energy generation. The other calming side of the autonomic nervous system is called the parasympathetic division and is a more slowly activated dampening system, promoting calming as the nerves return to regular function. The brain is shaped by events that it experiences as being linked. An infant may associate seeing a breast with hunger being satiated. This is an example of anticipation based on prior learning, which is an important function of the brain. As the neurons activated by this association repeatedly fire together, associating breast with satiation, breast with satiation, they are said to wire together as learning creates neural networks or information pathways. These associations and learnings are not conscious and explicit, the way our adult associations are, but are stored in implicit memory. When as adults we experience our lives as unsafe, we may return to this focus on security driven by self-interest. The second, or sacral chakra, is located in the lower abdomen and is associated with enjoying our bodies, emotions, and the emotional identity. The feeling here is, I am loved and lovable. It builds upon the first chakra and it develops from six to 18 months through positive connection between self and other. Most importantly, the primary caregiver, who is usually the mother. During this time, we see the development of the next part of our triune brain system, the mammalian brain, also known as the limbic system. It has unique features. The panic system, mammal infants cannot survive alone, audio-vocal communication between parent and child. It invites us to play, only seen in mammals, and this promotes harmony and sociality. Our evolutionary journey may in part be about exper experiencing greater joy. What also differentiates it from the reptilian brain 
is nursing and maternal care. You don't see many reptiles looking for a hug. It seeks pleasure and avoids pain, providing the emotional basis for motivated behavior. This is from where we get our sense of reality and truth as emotions and emotional learning inform our position. Survival for the mammalian brain is through attaching to someone who can take care of us as the human brain is constructed socially. Let's look at how this social construction happens when things go as they're meant to. Part of the priming for how the brain responds socially is the hardwiring to prefer the human face. This video clip shows the delight a one-year-old baby and mother share in their interaction. The infant is aroused by the eye contact with mum and then breaks contact in order to not become overstimulated. This is a natural dance of engaging and detaching. The mum tunes in to what's going on and the pleasure and play for both of them is clear. One thing the infant relies heavily on the mother for is helping it to regulate its distress. This is the requirement of our biological programming when our autonomic nervous system gets turned on. We become increasingly agitated and need a caregiver to help us soothe so that the parasympathetic dampening system can kick in and return us to balance. Over time, we learn to internalize this ability and can calm and soothe ourselves. When the mum is suddenly unavailable for the infant, it tries a number of strategies to try and get her attention back. Becoming increasingly distressed and moving towards panic When the mother is once again available, the baby's system calms again and it can return to the natural joy that exists from experiencing love and play. The attunement to the infant's system and role of helping it regulate distress seems to be a common factor in mammal species. The young ones can express discomfort and they will get their needs met. When this happens in humans, we learn that any expression of ourselves is good, lovable, and accepted. All the many parts of us are welcomed with no conditions. There may be temporary ruptures in the relationship, as in the video clip, which will then get repaired. We learn that social engagement is a source of calmness and pleasure, and this is one of the natural emergent properties of our biological systems. That is to say, we evolved to this. But what happens when parents are less attuned to their children? How does this throw our development off track and how do we correct it? Let's spend some time looking at the personality systems that are associated with insecure attachment. There are three. When our young nervous system gets activated and is not soothed by a caregiver, it's as if it gets stuck in the on or the off position, or bouncing between the two. When a baby expresses its distress and is seeking to be soothed, it may encounter a caregiver who is relatively responsive and then sometimes intrusive or unavailable. Their unpredictability and inconsistency generates anxiety for the infant. Where is mum or dad? The baby learns that its best chance of getting attention is to make its feelings really big. It may present as very angry and resisting the caregiver, or clingy and helpless. It focuses intensely on the promise of closeness and the likelihood of its loss, and these babies are hard to soothe. Their neediness may generate anxiety in their caregiver, and their anxiety can become chronic leading to predictable outcomes for the adult personality system. Let's look at the other side of the coin. What happens when the nervous system gets stuck in the off mode? 
When the agitated baby is repeatedly ignored or met with an intrusive approach, which is overstimulating, it learns that its needs will not be met. So he or she must learn to live as if they need no love. But beneath the surface is the same need for love that we all share. Again, there are predictable outcomes when these babies grow up. I'll focus on that later. The final type of personality system associated with insecure attachment is rare and oscillates between being permanently switched on, hyper and aroused, and switched off and flat. These infants have repeated experiences of fear, helplessness, humiliation and shame in relation to the parent who is at one and the same time the source of fear and comfort. These babies feel permanently overwhelmed and find it very hard to cope as adults. The vulnerability of the human infant means that it must adapt to its caregiver for protection, no matter how that caregiver behaves. The patterns of adaptation begin by the end of the fourth month of life and are consolidated by the end of the first year. And the patterns learned in infancy correspond to adult behavior with an unparalleled level of consistency. In each of these insecure systems, the brain anticipates that basic needs will never be met, associating the experience of need with increasing distress. And this belief creates a pathway in the brain, strengthened each time it is experienced. How we are able to regulate our own distress, known as affect regulation, more than any other factor determines our way of being in the world, as the core of the self lies in affect regulation. The third chakra is around the solar plexus and is associated with vitality, will and exploration, excitement about life, the right to be, and confidence. It builds upon the lower two chakras and is about knowing I'm worthy, it's associated with exploring and exercising our will on the environment and develops between 18 months and three years. About the same time, the neocortex, the uniquely human brain structure, kicks into high gear. This part of the triune brain is the seat of symbol use, thought and abstract thought, and making meaning. It is associated with logic and reason, problem solving, creativity, flexible thinking and perspective taking. It is familiar to meditators as the monkey mind, always chattering away. This part of our brain also allows us to be self-aware and reflective. It is the storyteller that likes to make meaning and we see it emerging at this age as children tell stories with their toys and dolls. Combined with the reptilian and mammalian brain, the neocortex gives rise to our personality and our individuality. The three brain regions work together, unless there is damage, and the physical centrality of the mammalian brain is reflective of how the feeling parts of us are linked to thoughts and behaviours. At this age, we become toddlers who begin to venture out and explore, and quickly return when it gets scary or too much. As we move through our infancy and into older childhood, we may experience an easy flow between exploring the world and coming home to safety and comfort. Knowing we can count on others brings a sense of personal safety and protection and a persisting sense of self-worth. This helps us feel it is safe to follow our innate curiosity. When we begin this exploration, we learn lessons about how we are supported in expressing our personal power. Strict parenting styles may teach us that power is about having power over another, that we need to be submissive or dominate and control, or risk being dominated and controlled. Permissive parenting styles 
may invite us to learn that we can exercise our will and desire in any way we choose, with no regard for the other. The neocortex functions in part as a storyteller. Its various narratives are dominated by feelings held by the different parts of us. What we have learned up to this age about relationships, power, control and will is held in our implicit memory. When events in later life trigger those memories, the neocortex makes meaning from these experiences and tells us stories forming beliefs about ourselves and others. If we have had negative experiences, then parts of us will hold negative beliefs about themselves. I'm a stupid little bitch. I should shut up moaning when I'm left on my own at night. I am fat and ugly and useless. I cry like a baby when I'm slapped. I'm horrible to have around. I don't deserve to have any friends. I never do anything right. I'm not just a stupid little bitch. I'm a nobody. These early negative beliefs and feelings may be thought of as attachment burdens that may necessitate extreme coping behaviours as adults that can throw us off balance. Most therapies operate from a third chakra orientation, seeking to invoke our will to change perceived dysfunction, to fix what is wrong. Many spiritual traditions are also based on third chakra thinking. They view the ego as an impediment to growth. In reality, this view is held by a part, commenting on another part or group of parts and calling it the ego. When safety, security and worth are established, we have a stable and secure foundation for psychological well-being as adults from which we are more likely to have compassionate loving attitudes towards others. From here we are whole and within this sense of wholeness lies the seeds of inner peace. The self, in internal family systems terms, that resides here is understood to have compassion, calmness, curiosity, creativity and desire for open-hearted connection, which corresponds with the energy of the fourth or heart chakra, the center of our being. In other words, when there is less distress within the personality system, it's easier to open up to our spiritual natures. This is what becomes available to us when, as infants, we are helped to regulate our own systems, soothe ourselves, and be supported in our explorations. We are biologically on track and able to follow our evolutionary path. If our early negative experiences are encoded in our brains in implicit memory and are so key in determining our adult personality systems, how can we hope to change them? The brain is now known to change itself through experience, known as brain plasticity or neuroplasticity. And the idea that the brain can change its own structure and function through thought and activity is the most important alteration in our view of the brain since we first sketched out its basic anatomy. Beliefs and feelings encoded as neural pathways, attachment burdens, can therefore be healed as negative emotional memory can be repatterned by changing the neuronal wiring of that memory. The question is how best to do this. The internal family systems IFS method of working with the personality system and its associated neural pathways is a kind of applied mindfulness and the key is curiosity and compassion. When we bring our conscious loving intent, our self in IFS terms, to our protective parts, which may be defensively filtering the world, 
and ask them to step back. We discover that basic wholesome qualities emerge spontaneously from within us. And this is our natural potential. Our strongest desire is to connect socially and express and receive love, nurturance and support. We can do this externally with other people. We can also do this internally with the parts of us seeking our attention. When we are able to bear witness from our hearts, we can invite the release of attachment burdens. Our protective systems can relax and we can view the world less defensively and with greater clarity and appreciation. To recap, early experience is held in implicit memory. When the human brain, the neocortex, develops, these early experiences are attributed meaning, like this. My mammalian nature tells me I'm meant to get my needs met, because that's what mammals do. If my needs were not met, it must be because there's something inherently wrong with me. I am flawed in some way. This false belief compels the personality system to focus on self-reliance, to prove that I'm okay, or relationships that serve to assure me that I am okay as coping strategies. With the result that the person finds it difficult to access and express compassion and altruism as various forms of insecurity suppress or interfere with compassionate caregiving. Most of us, of course, spend time thinking about relationships or doing well in some way. It's when the chattering and busyness in our minds feels driven that we have to focus on this, that we can assume that there's some exiled part needing our attention. So how can we reduce this chatter to get more peace and clarity? We all have different parts to us, of course, and our protective parts work very hard to be alert to perceived threats from within and without that might trigger some vulnerability. When those vulnerable parts do get triggered, our protective system may seek to bring a return to calm by distracting us in whatever way they feel they must, perhaps by using the critical voice or minimizing the distress, saying, ah, it's not that big a deal. We can become aware of our protective parts when we notice them obsessing or ruminating about relationships. Why did I have to say that? I hope they're okay with me. And or success. How can I improve on what I did last time? Or we may notice the protective parts seeking to soothe us with food or anger, sleep, alcohol, drugs, which may be prescription or recreational, dissociating, self-harm, etc. Seeking to ease the distress with distractions. And then critical parts may come in saying, oh, we shouldn't be doing that. Sometimes the noise inside our heads generated by these parts can feel like we're living inside a pinball machine. But we can get curious about them. We may ask, how come you spend so much time doing this? What do you believe would happen internally or externally if you didn't? Generally speaking, their answers will tell you that if they didn't take the lead in this way, something bad could happen. Like a part that believes or worries that it is somehow flawed, perhaps unworthy, unsafe, empty, or feeling like a failure, may overwhelm us. Or others, other people may criticize us, triggering a part that believes it is bad. These are the exiled parts that hold the detailed living knowledge of the conditionality of love, based on their experience of not getting their needs met, for which they believe they are to blame. It is the existence of these parts that fuels the search for unconditional love. As we become familiar with our personality system, we may discover vulnerable young protective parts constantly vigilant against possible threats, taking care of vulnerable distressed parts. With permission from the protective system, we can bring our healing compassion to whichever parts have appropriated inaccurate beliefs and distressing feelings based on difficult and unsupported life experiences. The key is curiosity with no intention to fix, change or eliminate. We don't become compassionate and kind. 
kindness and compassion are already there. When blended parts, parts that like to manage everything, step back, self is revealed. And we recognize the truth in the Dalai Lama's words that every human being has the same potential for compassion. By bringing our curiosity and compassion to the parts holding these burdens, we can help them to be released. It seems likely that this process facilitates neural rewiring and the plasticity of the brain means that new connections may now be formed associated with truths such as, I am safe, I am lovable, I belong, allowing the personality system to be at peace and more of our true selves to be available. When we choose to operate from the fourth chakra, the internal noise generated by our distressed systems is attended to and healed as we experience greater peace and become more available for spiritual growth. Disorders and symptoms may be seen as clusters of parts in extreme places doing their best to protect the system. Symptoms of psychiatric disorders are actually strategies of protection. When our personality system is organized around suffering, the repeated representing or re-presenting of reality will be through the filter and frame of suffering and threat. Our internal representational world may therefore be illusory as the system needs to distort or deny information that contradicts core beliefs held by burdened parts. We see the world through the filter of our protective system. Put another way, the truth you believe and cling to makes you unavailable to hear anything new. For example, Hearing, I love you, has no place to take root, blossom and flourish in a system where I am unlovable already has purchase. So, early negative emotional experiences get encoded in the brain as implicit memories entrenched in specific neural pathways and, as we get older, different parts of us take on the associated burdensome beliefs as they make meaning from these experiences. Protective parts and their behaviours always point to exiled parts that exist implicitly until awareness reaches them and they are felt as emotional truths. When parts within the system are welcomed and loved by self, this allows for the transformative process, the unburdening, that invites the system to reconfigure and experience calmness. It is as if the wounds never occurred. It is only when new learning unwires old learning that transformational change can occur. When the system becomes self-led and there is greater peace and clarity, if parts of our systems do get triggered, we can acknowledge and soothe them, allowing us to be less reactive. When our perceptions are organized around peacefulness, compassion and joy, instead of the suffering of different parts, we are aligned with our evolving consciousness. It may be that at this time of global crisis, our individual and species evolution is stepping us from the third chakra need to dominate as a response to perceived threat to a desire to co-create for the betterment of us all. The direction of growth described by the chakra system is from density, contraction and individuality to freedom, expansion, abstraction and universality. This center of our whole being, the fourth chakra, unites the lower chakras associated with our physical being with the three upper chakras associated with our spiritual nature. When we are centered, we are more in tune with and available for the energies and experiences associated with the higher chakras.
The fifth chakra is located at the throat and is associated with communication, sound, vibration, self-expression and creativity. Because it builds on the qualities of the fourth, it allows us to clearly hear, for example, the distress informing anger being directed towards us. Many spiritual traditions use song, dance, chanting, hymns, mantras as forms of worship and or to achieve a more clear spiritual space. And some quantum physicists tell us that reality is composed of nothing but the interweaving dance of vibrating strings. The mystic Rumi famously used dance to access divine knowledge and wisdom. Among his received teachings are, if light is in your heart, you will find your way home. Psychic channelers describe hearing and receiving information from higher sources. Some people describe hearing comforting, reassuring and encouraging comments that they attribute to guides. The sixth chakra, located at the brow, is associated with intuition, the imagination and clear seeing, or in French, clairvoyance. This is our inner eye, or third eye, and the element is light. It is from here that we can see the light, sometimes called the holy light, in ourselves and others. And also see and deeply appreciate the beauty of the world in which we live as we develop the awareness of the interconnectedness of all being. Thich Nhat Hanh informs us that we are here to awaken from our illusion of separateness. The final place on our evolutionary journey is the crown chakra. This chakra is understood to connect us with the ground of all being, divine love, the infinite, God, one, bliss, perfection. Although we attempt to describe it, this is the place beyond words, the source of all manifestation, in which there is no separation of the transcendent without and the immanent within. The crown chakra is where our spirit enters and leaves the body, individuating as it enters us and returning to the all as it leaves. As Ken Wilbur informs us, if spirit is completely transcendent, it is also completely immanent, meaning there is no separation. Spirit resides within and without. And this is reflected in the Sanskrit greeting, Namaskar, meaning, I salute the form that you have taken, and therefore acknowledging that your form differs from your spiritual essence, in which we are all one. The chakra system would seem to offer us the promise that as we become more clear and still, we may have access to transcendent wisdom and knowledge. Master teachers have all echoed the same understanding. The Upanishads, the texts forming the basis of the Hindu religion, tell us when one realizes the self in whom all life is one, then one fears no more. The Gospel of St. Thomas invites us to recognize that the kingdom of heaven is spread upon the earth. And from the prophet Muhammad, richness does not lie in the abundance of goods, but richness is the richness of the soul. I have described a method for achieving greater peace within, which may also facilitate access to spiritual growth. However, it seems non-ordinary states of consciousness involving intense emotions, visions and other sensory changes and unusual thoughts as well as various physical manifestations, what may be considered a spiritual emergency, can occur to anyone at any time. These may include the awakening of Kundalini, episodes of unitive consciousness, or a profound recognition of the interconnectedness of being. Some people have reported communication with or possession by malevolent beings. Many people have had spiritual experiences related to the use of teacher plants, such as peyote, cactus, ayahuasca, and ibogaine, as well as sexual experiences which can 
trigger states identical to those attained by spiritual adepts of all traditions. Participation in rave culture, with or without the use of psychoactive drugs, as well as other forms of ecstatic dance and ritual, may also trigger a change in consciousness. When experiences such as these come into our lives and we do not have a framework with which to understand them, we can feel overwhelmed. Parts of us may worry that we're going crazy. All these experiences may be denied or distorted by our personality systems into delusions of grandiosity that may lead to abuses of power and or sexual misconduct, especially if the burdens held in the lower three chakras have not been attended to. It is not uncommon to hear stories of spiritual leaders who have acquired followers and behaved inappropriately. If evolution is an ascent towards consciousness, then it looks like the brain is driving us forward, the chakra system provides us with a map, and the self is the navigator that can get us back on track when our personality systems periodically land us in the ditch. Infant stress has been shown to disrupt brain functioning linked to behavior that is geared towards preserving our own species. And as a result, a permanent bias towards self-preservation can become an adult trait. So healing that stress benefits us individually and collectively. It behooves us to take proper care of the children. Unlike the leap from reptile to mammal, the next step in our evolution involves choice. Our neocortex brings us the capacity for self-awareness and the ability to make this choice. The spiritual quest involves directed effort that focuses the mind, enabling it to deconstruct ordinary perceptual realities. These perceptual realities are held by our parts. The Buddha admonishes us, resolutely train yourself to attain peace. If we align our will with the intent to allow our compassionate nature to serve us by healing internally, and we also bring that compassion to other sentient beings, then we open to the possibility of experiencing the joy of our spiritual nature. In watching this video, you may have noticed different parts of you responding, maybe skeptical parts or critical, distracting or engaged, perhaps hopeful or irritated or any other number of parts. There may be parts that inflate the promise of spiritual growth or parts that may be dismissive. They're all worth getting to know. They are yours. You may have encountered a spiritual manager. If so, your dialogue may look something like the following. Okay, I can do this. Just get to know those parts and then find out about them and help them out. Hi. Oh, hi. Who are you? I'm the guy who leads the system, and it's nice to meet you. Can you tell me a bit about yourself? Sure. I'm the one that got you into therapy all those years ago and keep you focused on doing good and meaningful work. So you've been around a long time. So tell me, what might happen if you didn't do all this? Well. That guy might take over, and he just doesn't care about other people. He's kind of self-absorbed and a bit pitying. But now that I've heard all about the brain and the personality and stuff, I'm going to fix him and tell him he doesn't need to feel that way anymore. I see. Well, I appreciate how you want to help. How would it be if I got to know that guy a bit? Would that be okay with you? Uh, sure. Spiritual manager parts have the desire for us that we be wise, good, maybe even perfect. They have strong wills and may attempt to fix us with a variety of tools. Google yields 1,700 million hits for self-help. Affirmations, focusing on the positive, being mindful, waking up with gratitude, healthy eating, meditation, may all be parts of their armory. 
They may seek to fix others through advice. Well-intentioned as they are, the shoulds that these managers operate by invite polarized parts in the system that may not like being told what to do. When you hear inside how you should meditate or eat healthily to be a better person, the polarized part that doesn't want to may take a stand and say no. The manager may then redouble its efforts, bringing more tension within and possibly triggering a part that feels like a failure. When our spiritual managers take the lead and try to impose their will on other parts, it does not lead to healing. Yet, if you get curious about the part that doesn't want to meditate, for example, it will let you know how it too is seeking to benefit the system. It may be aware of an anxious, exiled part that would come up if you sat quietly for too long. Spiritual managers may also misinterpret developmental longings, for example, to be loved or feel important, as spiritual. When we bring our self-energy to the parts, there is no trying or agenda other than the desire to connect with the part. Once it becomes fully known, it is possible for it to release any distress it is carrying. Will working with our systems in this way lead to enlightenment? Suzuki Roshi says, strictly speaking, there are no enlightened people, only enlightened activity. My experience of bringing more self-energy into my own system and witnessing many of the folks I've worked with do the same is that along with greater peace comes gratitude. Gratitude seems to open the door for grace, which one neuropsychologist defines as the gift of enabling power sufficient for progression conveyed by the divine to and through humanity. I hope this video has been helpful to you. It's part of my contribution to making things better. I thank you for yours, whatever it may be. In the words of Ram Das, at the end of the day, we're all just walking each other home. Namaskar. <laughs>